Can you hear me? I don't ever talk with a microphone, so it's kind of special. Um, I'm Erin Burns. I'm a weed scientist. Um, I do work in potatoes, forages, and corn. And a number of you have probably heard me talk about volunteers the past two years or two past field days. Um, the handout that's going on right now is a two-pager that goes over some trials that we did a few years ago about volunteer management and corn. Um, this is on our website and talked about before. You've, you've seen it before. I think we struggle with volunteers because they emerge at all different times. They're in different layers of that soil profile. Some of them come up earlier, some of them wait around. So it's not like our typical weed, which we often get like predicted flushes. Um, so trying, I think where a lot of people struggle with is timing of that herbicide application for maximum, both maximum control and early enough where it hasn't already, you know, robbed that yield away from whatever crop that you're growing. So we focused on volunteer management and corn. So on the sheet today, there's a number of group 27 herbicides. Those are HPPD inhibitors. That's the site of action class that if you look down the, the herbicide label, you usually see it on the upper right hand corner or right in the middle in combinations with and without atrazine and then with the appropriate adjuvant. So you can see on most of these, we added crop oil concentrate, so a little bit hotter adjuvant. Adjuvant choice for volunteer management is pretty important. You want thorough coverage to get around those leaf structures. So maybe upping your gallons per acre that you're applying these herbicides at, it'd be interesting to, to talk to see what people are applying those at and what success they're having. And then um, adjuvant choice. So maybe using one of the, the oils, crop oil, um, MSO if it's labeled, to get uh, that maximum penetration through that leaf layer um, into the plant because that, that's probably the biggest thing. So those are two things that you can also play around with. And like many others on the second page, we found that if you can spray the volunteers when they're smaller, six to eight inches or less, we had pretty good success at both controlling the top growth and preventing any of that daughter tuber, tuber formation, which is that second part of what you're trying to prevent uh, with uh, volunteer management. New to this year on the second page to you, the page with all the photos. Um, I tried to do a quick search online and talk to a few colleagues about controlling volunteers and other crops. So um, it should really say suppression of <laughs> volunteers, by no means control with some of these herbicides and a few of these other crops. So I have ones for, for winter wheat. For winter wheat, it's tough because you're, you know, you're up against the the time of the growth stage of that wheat often, and sometimes those volunteers haven't haven't fully emerged yet, or the whole flush hasn't come up. Uh, so waiting, you know, that'll be kind of your decision guide on that. A few options in soybean. Um, I put some in dry bean. I haven't. I don't know if anybody's had volunteer issues in dry bean. Anybody here? Probably not. Oh, you have. Okay. I just I was like trying to think of the crops around here. So I was like, what are some options? Dry beans nice, you plant a little bit later, so you do have that opportunity to control that flush earlier on via some pretty aggressive tillage or a burn down herbicide, depending on, on what you're going for. So that can be a, a good way to clean up prior to planting. And then some alfalfa and sugar beet options too. Um, by no means do these completely control the volunteer plants. I mean, the best is having solid agronomics in that potato year to reduce the number of um, potatoes that are left in the ground. but. You know, once we once we have them there, we, we try to control them. So these were these are the best things I could find in, in talking with colleagues around the U.S. to attempt to slow them down a little bit to to get some control. So um, that's probably the end I have for volunteers. Does anybody have any other volunteer questions, observations? <laughs> Yeah, so Roundup was a really unique one. So we had great control one year, probably 90, 95%, and then hardly any the next year. Same size uh, volunteers, same application equipment. Um, we used the water that was here, AMS, all that stuff. So everything else was normalized. So I just put kind of a, a question mark on that one just because talking with other colleagues have had various success at if that's, you know, um, if that can control or not. So we were just seeing if we could go spray once and then see what happens. How long could we get control? So how 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 many weeks of control could you expect um, and things like that? So you could definitely, as long as you're not up to the maximum label rate, a lot of these could be um, two-shot programs depending on 
I think both crop stage. So we tried to wait a little bit longer to get the majority of volunteers that would emerge um, and things like that. But How that's all. We're usually eight and a half pounds for a hundred gallons. You could go 16 if you wanted. Why are you going the low rate? Just because that's, we've had the water tested it's here and. Cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I found, I found a big difference. If you cheat on AMS, you won't get the control. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's a good debate. And opinion. Right. And so depending on, you know, what it is, I think, yeah, for, for price wise, we probably did that. And also we've had the water tested here and on campus where I've done some stuff. But yeah, knowing what AMS rate is right for your your water is important. Anybody else? I've seen, I guess, soybeans. Um, Raptor with Roundup works very well, but Raptor on its own, you're not going to get much control. Um, definitely use max rate of Raptor for your crop, but Raptor and Roundup work really well. It's a good observation. And with some of the new um, you know, 2,4-D or dicamba tolerant soybeans, you also have some, some uh, extra options, which I didn't put on there, but that would just be dictated by what, what trait you're putting on. So that's another new, I think a new thing we could play around with in the future to optimize that system too. Right. So some of these should have just been like suppression quotations, your best option. I can't, I wish I, being, well, with any pest, we always want to have like the best answer, but sometimes there's just not, not a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Right, so that, yeah, this year was supply chain issues too. And the nice thing about Husky is it does have that group 27, which is what um, the pictures were for all the corn herbicides. So it shares one of those components so that can be pretty effective and have a little bit longer residual than some of your other options. But yeah, there were a multitude of issues this year for you guys. So I'm gonna switch gears to dry weather and weed control. And I am going to apologize. This is a lot of chemistry. So I don't, chemistry was not my favorite class in uh, any of my degrees that I, that I have, but how herbicides interact with the soil and with precipitation just comes down to the chemistry of that particular herbicide. Um, so we'll go over, I think, some basic principles. It is, uh, it can get pretty complicated pretty fast. So I've just highlighted uh, two principles and I'll give you a chance to give this uh, handout um, a way to get get around it's not the fanciest handout but it w gets kind of at the nitty-gritty of what what choices you're making when trying to make herbicide selections I think um, about, across a number of environmental factors so I get calls most years Aaron I got three to four inches of rain after my pre-emergence herbicide what's gonna stick around this year I was like Aaron I've had no rain in two three weeks now what's gonna what's gonna be available so I think when we're moving forward um, we can also start you know besides thinking about what weeds these herbicides control um, and what sites of action we're using for herbicide resistance management we can also think about how the chemical properties of these herbicides are and how they relate to our weather conditions so that mostly comes down to, uh, so this table on the front, I've just highlighted a number of pre-emergence herbicides that you guys use in potato. And I have the trade name, the group number, I'm gonna lose all my sheets. And then water solubility. So water solubility and soil organic sorption coefficient, or KOC, are the two things that are gonna play a major role at how long that herbicide sticks around in the soil, how much precipitation or irrigation we need to put down to have that herbicide become active in the soil solution, to be contacted by those germinating weed seeds. Uh, that also plays a big role. We were dry this year, so a lot of our weed emergence was a little bit later because the weeds need moisture to germinate also. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. So to predict the performance of these pre-herbicides, we gotta keep those two things in mind. Also, what is our soil? So what's the, 
what's the composition, how much organic matter do we have, and then what's the environmental parameters we're dealing with. So those are the three things that we keep in mind. So the solubility of a herbicide, I have them ranked from low to high. Low would mean not very soluble in water at all. High would mean highly soluble in water. So um, we can go over those two. So a herbicide that has low solubility, so things like prowl, sonalan, um, you might be familiar with those needing incorporation that also plays a role in some of these. Um, they need uh, much more rain to become incorporated uh, to be taken up by those weed seeds. So if we don't have much moisture, those, per, those types of herbicides um, aren't going to control our weeds as effectively. And then if they are highly, highly soluble, so point number five, they're relatively easy to incorporate with limited rainfall um, and that's good. It's also bad if we get too much rain. So those are the ones that could easily leach through the soil profile. Most of our weed seeds germinate in the top two to three inches of soil. That herbicide goes down too fast. Um, we're not gonna see the control that we would expect also. So those two things are something I um, think we'll start to play around with and I'll start thinking about when I'm designing my herbicide programs, I think for next year for the field day, is combining both herbicides that have um, pre-emergence projects with low solubility and also high. So that would uh, then become a blanket at what range of environmental conditions we might have. So then you might be a little bit safer if we're dry, also a little bit safer if we're, um, if we're wet. So I'd be interested to know, so after your pre's went down, who here irrigated those in right away? One, two, a few. Some people, I know a lot of people tried to wait. Uh, those are some questions I got too. So that's a that's a great tool that you guys have is the ability to put down that precipitation. So think about. I feel like it worked that well. So, yeah. So that's that's my second second point, which I didn't put on here. So if you if you let's say you waited a few days, it was really dry. The soil moisture was really dry. Um, it actually takes more precipitation to get that herbicide because it's already bound so tightly onto that soil. Um, soil, you know, the soil that it takes a while to get it to actually come off to go into solution. I was thinking maybe you need to irrigate before you spray and then irrigate So, after yep, that would fix it too. So if you could either do that first, so then it's already, you know, it's not going to have that time to bind to that soil molecule, or you put down enough where it forces it to go out into soil solution. So that's another thing when we're, when we're really dry and the soil, and you're going into dry ground, you might need a little bit more, um, a little bit more irrigation than what you what you would currently expect and then the last is the KOC so that's how tightly those herbicides are bound to the soil so the higher the more tightly they're bound and you can see that they have we have herbicides with low water solubility often have very high KOC values so that's kind of a rule of thumb there are some that don't follow that um, so those are those are other ideas to kind of keep in mind when we are when we're designing herbicide programs to to try to get a, around that whole range of, of, of weather conditions that we've had this this past spring so um, this winter I'm going to sit down and try to think about trying to pair these herbicides both in mind of what weeds they control our sites of action but then what chemist chemical products or chemical properties do they have that would keep them um, around in the soil given really dry or really wet and see and that could be another unfortunately another thing to think about when we're when we're making our herbicide application so there's a there's a lot that goes into it but with that I think that was like kind of a fast crash course in in herbicide chemistry um, and feel free to give me a call this winter and we could we could start playing around with that too so here are some you know pre products I'm thinking about and, and where holes might be in that particular program to, to try to try to fill. So now any general weed questions? It doesn't have to be volunteers or, or herbicides in dry weather. Any observations? I always learn a lot from these when people share about their weed problems. I know sometimes people don't like to say they have weed issues, but I get jazzed about it. Aaron, do you yeah. think we'll ever get to where there's a model built where you have certain weather will tend to be tell you to use certain chemistries or so that's a great question so the question was that there ever be a model that could be built incorporating these kind of environmental factors into herbicide choice I don't know if anyone's really played around with it the models are the models that I've 
currently try to be are mostly predicting weed emergence, so timing of herbicides with that. But that would be a that'd be a nice a nice tool. Like it got me thinking. So there's a volunteer model. So most of the models that we have are predicting emergence. So it's either emergence or, or the probability that the volunteers would survive over winter. Um, so that's, that's uh, Jamie helps uh, keep that up. So that's on the MSU's website. And then um, there's some trying at weed germination, but there's, it's a lot more complex than what we, what we ended up thinking. But I think that would be, that would be a really interesting way to, to add to that. Which weeds are the worst? It's been the worst problem the last couple of years. Which give you three examples. And so which weeds are the worst in potatoes? So you got I mean, you probably have the growers here that could answer that a little bit better than me. Um, but you know there's always grass, grasses. And common lambs quarter probably. And common lambs quarters is probably pretty I did people have more control failures this year than in the past? Yeah. Common lamb yeah, common lambs quarters is a great plant that um, its leaf tissue will actually um, forms more of like a callus uh, tissue and that can be really hard for that herbicide to get into that that plant so I, I definitely got a lot more common lamb square questions this year about thinking it was resistant but really it it's really good at kind of withstanding those those dry conditions by making the, the leaves both a little bit hairier and then so common ragweed and then um, you know, always keep the eye out for water hemp and palmer amaranth. They're, palmer is mostly, you know, there's pockets. Water hemp is much more widespread throughout our state. I'm surprised I don't get water hemp and potato questions. I've gotten very few, so that's just something to keep an eye out for. Um, that I've discussed at, at previous field days, and we have resources on our on our website, which is on the on one of those handouts that I share with uh, Dr. Christy Sprague. So we have lots of good weed science resources on there. Yeah, and we've played around with, you know, putting in a residual on that post-emergence application. So we've done dual or metolachlor um, and had pretty decent luck. So that obviously won't control any of the weeds that have already emerged, but it'll give you a few weeks extra at some of those grasses. So we've we've tried to dial in that timing and have had uh, various levels of success on that just to give you some more post options because there just aren't that many in potato and very few that have any kind of residual long-lasting implication. And you end up doing a trial all yeah, so this this trial right there is actually looking at different combinations of matrix and metribuzin. Just we were trying to figure out some some broad leaves to some of our newer potato varieties. So my goal is that the eventually the weed control guide would have uh, potato varieties that are more applicable to what you're what you're planting today. And then um, Chris did put dual over his whole one of his whole variety trials so he did that last year and didn't have any injury and then he's going to do it again and we're going to compile that and put that into a fact sheet too just to you know there's so many different varieties to understand what was going on but yep so we've I mean I think he has at least like 20 it's it's a large number <laughs> no so we dug up some plants here um, we had one variety that had some yellowing, which I would I would expect with some of the metribuzin and applications, but so far the tubers look pretty good. Um, and then we're we're taking this to yield, so we'll be able to understand um, all the roles on that too, which is pretty important. All right. Corey might walk more time, we're on time. I guess general herbicide update. I don't know of anything brand new to potatoes that will, um, a new active ingredient that's, that's, that's brand new. There's going to be some new pre-mixtures that I have tested kind of on the other side of the farm that I'll have some data on to talk about this winter, um, but mostly just combining active ingredients and not just brand new active ingredients to potatoes. So everyone usually always asks me that, is there some new, new herbicide coming out? Um, and as much as I know, no, but stay tuned. <laughs> All right, any other weedy questions? I'll be around for a while too at lunch, so you can talk to me about that. We're always looking for good fields too, so if you have your, what you know about going into your weediest field in potatoes next year, let me know, because 
good pressure is always good to try to stress some of these herbicides.